how's the yeah. how's the weather in uh, in LA at the moment? What's what's the temp like? It's good. I mean, I like winter and spring and fall a lot more than summer. Okay. Because it's actually um, quite nice. I mean, currently we have like 20 degrees and during the day, and then I think around like 10 degrees at night. Okay. So it's quite nice. Um, the summer usually gets very uncomfortable, so I don't actually, I never advise people to come here in summer. <laughs> Okay, what sort of temperature would you be dealing with on a daily basis in the summertime? In the summertime, I mean, it depends on the summer, but yeah. um, it can get, sometimes for several weeks, it can be 40 degrees or 45 degrees, depending on where you are, because it is a desert. Yeah. I mean, at least it's the dry heat, usually. Yeah. Um, and I live very close to the beach, so I actually get a lot of Pacific uh -huh. Ocean breeze. Perfect. but it can get very very hot and usually the nice thing about the desert is that it cools down at night to 18 degrees or something okay but there are usually there's usually one month or six weeks where it also doesn't cool down at night and it's, it's just you have to run the air conditioning the entire yeah. time <laughs> okay so, yeah uh, that sounds very hot much yeah fall and spring are much nicer the air is cleaner and um, it's like really nice, you know, 25 degrees, you know, and at night it's 15. So it's like the perfect temperature to do something and enjoy yourself and also sleep at night. So, yeah, yeah it's nice to be able to sleep at night without waking up, uh, sweating all the time. I definitely know all about that coming from where I'm from. That was, um, yeah, yeah it's just very hot, sweaty summers and uh, winter was beautiful. But now I'm seeing what actual seasons are like living in Berlin. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's been snowing quite a lot uh, the last week, well, which has been amazing. But I also see now why people don't like the snow so much because it gets pretty um, frustrating in the city, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. But yeah, what's, uh, so what's, what's, uh, let's talk about what's coming up for you first. We'll talk about the future. What are you most excited about that you're working on at the moment? Um... I don't know if, yeah, I think I can talk about it. I mean, the first thing that's going to come out, it's currently um, slated for um, end of March, I believe. It keeps moving back because it's a theatrical release, okay. but it'll be in cinemas in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Um, it's called Help I Shrunk My Friends. Um, right. In German, it would be Hilfe, ich habe meine Freunde geschrumpft, yeah. um, which is kind of the third part in a movie series that I've been doing. Um, so that's coming out in currently March. Um, originally, it was supposed to come out in beginning of January, but that didn't happen, of course. Fair enough. Uh, then I'm currently working on um, a horror movie. <laughs> I okay. just started, that, which is completely new territory for me. Um, and the Christmas movie I did last year for Netflix uh, is getting a sequel. So we're going to be doing that this year. Um, the Claus family, that is. Or would you say the, Claus the Klaus, or Klaus? Yeah, Klaus. The, the Klaus family. <laughs> That's my terrible yeah. Australian uh, pronunciation of <laughs> Klaus. <laughs> it's, it's going to be released. The first part is going to come out internationally on Netflix uh, this year. And then we're already releasing the second part, which hopefully is going to be a theatrical release this time, because the first one was also supposed to be a theatrical release. Um, and then I have a bunch of stuff in the works. Um, there's one more I can talk about. It's a war drama um, called The Last Front. It's a World War I drama, thriller drama um, that I will be scoring this year. Um, and the other things I cannot talk about yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's super cool though that you've got a, a, some other things in the pipeline there that are still still under wraps I'm not surprised having sort of looked at what's been happening for you in recent times and I mean to be honest when I started digging a little bit deeper <laughs> about what's happened I guess in your run leading up to this point of your career <laughs> you've had some pretty nice touch points there I saw you were interning um, at Hans Zimmer's uh, remote control productions and Work with a bunch of other super cool people. Um, 
does it I mean it's, it's obviously been quite a long time that you've been working but how has it, it does it feel like it's been an age that's taken you sort of to get to this point as an artist or has it all been a bit of a blur um kind of both I mean <laughs> um it's especially when you're kind of in the trenches it, it can become a bit of a blur when yeah. you're just constantly working and you don't even know what's happening anymore and it's just a constant output um but it still feels like it's been a constant grind because I mean for every project that I get that you can see um you know there's 50 projects that I didn't get mm. so uh, that's kind of what we're talking about here you know so um people on the outside don't usually see how much we actually pitch for stuff. Even now, you know, you think having a manager or an agent would make a difference. The difference is just you get different pitches, but mm -hmm. you're still going to be pitching just as much and just sending cold emails and just reaching out to people, meeting people, um, you know, sending out reels, setting up meetings. And then, you know, one out of 50 or one out of 100 actually goes anywhere with me so it's uh it's such an uphill battle that a lot of people i think don't see um so a lot of people look at my credentials and they go oh things have been going really well for you and i'm like yeah you know how many hundreds of productions i didn't get these are just the nuggets that someone threw me along the way and a lot of them um also only came after years and years of assisting people, years of making these relationships um, until someone was like, oh, hey, she's been around for, you know, five years now and she's been doing an okay job. Maybe we should give her something, you know? Yeah. So, so a lot of it is really, um, you have to work for it for so long. And, and, you know, I'm feeling like I'm getting a little bit of traction now on mm. you know mid-sized and bigger productions that I'm in the running for at least now mm. but I think it's still going to take years before you know anybody on the higher level is going to go oh you know now she has you know 60 composer credits maybe now we can give her something bigger you know so it just takes so much time and so much staying on people's radar and doing the work doing more and more movies um you know that it's um it's it's a real um constant you know swimming against the the current and just trying not to drown <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely yeah i i was reading i think in in an article that or an interview that had been published about you sort of spoke um a lot of the story, I guess, was this, um, as you said, like a lot of your opportunities come from taking assisting roles. And I noticed that a lot in answers you'd given in the past about how things had come about where um, perhaps you had a connection and then you got brought in so supporting and this then leads to being out of work um, in a more leading role. And I guess eventually now through all of that, you also got yourself to a point where with equality, you're sort of hunting also for your own work now. Um, how many people do you have working with you in equality? Um, it, it varies. Um, I have one um, additional writer that I bring on for almost every project. And then I have um, two or three people that I rotate out for additional writing, depending on their skill set and what the movie requires. Um, then I often have part-time assistants that do smaller tech tasks that, you know, if I just can't do it timing wise, then I'll just have someone come in and do, you know, MIDI prep or Pro Tools session prep or something, mm -hmm. um, stuff like that, or help me proofread scores if I don't have time. Um, and uh, sometimes I have interns though. I mean, currently I don't, but um, sometimes I, I do have that, which is more of a learning opportunity for, um, recent graduates and something like that, um, or people who are still studying. Um, and then um, I have my go-to orchestrator, but he's a freelancer. I just, you know, hire him in on a per project basis. And then I have uh, my go-to mixer who I also hire in on a per project basis. Okay. 
Um, that's an interesting topic. I guess it takes me away from what I was planning to talk about. But when, uh, in terms of mixing, uh, for, uh, for yourself, obviously you have someone that was, this will go away and, and do this for you all of the time, a mixing engineer. Um, it depends. I uh, usually get the mixing engineer, first of all, if the budget allows, but also um, a lot of productions, um, both uh, theatrical productions, but also Netflix, actually. They want um, surround mixes uh -huh. of final score. Yeah. And especially if it goes to a theater, it's such a specific thing that really needs to work. And I'm not um, qualified to do that. So Understood. then I really have to get someone who has, you know, a Dolby certified room and can do a proper theatrical surround mix for me. Okay, yeah, that makes that makes uh, a lot of sense. And I guess after, I mean, how does it feel to be kind of, I guess, at the helm of something after probably a lot of years being on the opposite side of the fence mm -hmm. where you were just doing a small supporting role, I guess, in in an overall score? How does it feel to be, I guess, yeah, the person that's giving the opportunity or running the team now? Uh, I like it. I mean, I've always been kind of an alpha type personality. Yeah. Um, and I like making the rules and having things work my way, yeah. um, which, you know, I learned a lot from being a team member. I learned a lot from other composers in how they manage their team and what the tasks are. And it really helps me knowing what everybody's doing and how fast they can do it. And, you know, what the pricing is and you know, all these kinds of things, mm. um, because I've been on the other side. So I kind of, um, and it's not been that long ago, so I kind of still understand, you know, what you want from a position and what the expectations are and how to communicate. Um, and I, I really like that. Uh, something, it was something that was always frustrating me. I mean, I was a good employee, but I was never a happy employee. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah. I was very diligent and my work ethic was good and everything, but I always hated not calling the shots. I'm much better if someone just gives me a task and then I do it my way and I just deliver it, mm. you know, before the deadline. Um, working under other people can just sometimes be frustrating if they're doing it in a way that you disagree with and then you still have to do it their way and you can't really you don't have a lot of agency over yourself, your time, what you do, you know, mm. you have to show up at a certain time and you have to take breaks at a certain time and you leave at a certain time, <laughs> you know, you get a set salary that you can't really renegotiate throughout the year that much, you know, it was all of these things that just, it just bothered me to have this little freedom in a way. Yeah. So I really enjoy just having my own company now and just going, okay, um, I just make my own rules now and we're going to work the way I want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's certainly one of the be benefits um, of running your own show. But I guess you already spoke about the, the other side of that, which is always having to fight for the work or find the work. Um, yeah. How did, I mean, obviously we're here now, you're running a business, uh, you know, you have some cred in the industry. You're definitely getting some some bigger contracts for I mean, huge, huge companies is, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure on the stats, but I'm pretty sure Netflix has got to be one of the biggest broadcasting things there is right now. Right. So yeah. that's a pretty good place to be in. Is this, uh, like, is this why you got into composing music to be kind of, uh, obviously you can go higher profile and everything like this, but is this the sort of work that you want to be doing now, uh, regardless of the scale of the projects that you're doing? Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, this is why I came to Los Angeles in the first place, because um, I wanted to work on studio productions. I want to work on, specifically animation is my favorite thing to do. Cool. Um, and I, I love being in kids entertainment, but also, um, you know, getting more into drama, getting more into science fiction, fantasy, um, and more, you know, adult uh, type content that's really where my heart is. And I, I just really want to work on these types of productions where you have you know, people at the highest level bringing their A game and creating something that could be, you know, that could become a classic or that at least, um, you know, becomes something that 
becomes available to everybody around the world and that people can watch and enjoy. Okay. Um, so this is definitely the trajectory I wanted to be on. And um, I definitely intend to go, you know, further in, in that direction. <laughs> yeah, of course. But yeah, I can see that. That's, that's pretty clear for sure. So I guess, I mean, if, I think you answered my next question, which is why, why are you composing music? It, it sounds like it's so that you can sort of leave some sort of widespread, long lasting, at least some period of joy in people's lives. Yeah, yeah, it's really that because um, growing up, I really enjoyed music, movies, books. I mean, any type of storytelling and especially if it was music storytelling, that was just my favorite escapism growing up and uh, I still enjoy it I mean it's still one of my favorite things to do going to a theater is um, I mean I'm, I really miss it right now um, but that was something that I really did you know once a week or something I just got a theater subscription and I would just go and and get that experience and uh, because I've been enjoying this since I was two years old that's when I saw my first movie in theaters it was like Thing was the little mermaid um yeah. so you know it's uh it's been a long time and it still fascinates me to just go to a theater the atmosphere you know the lights go down the sound the, the screen every it's just such an experience and since i enjoy it so much i'm just feeling very fortunate that i can work in this and then um bring this kind of experience also to other people uh, yeah, that's interesting. So like your first influence really has come from the theater in, in, in storytelling. Who was it that took you, can I ask? Was it your grandparents or your parents? It was my parents okay. that took me. Cool. Okay, very interesting. Do you think that, uh, I guess, having a lot of time in, I mean, theaters generally, not always, but better theaters obviously have quite good acoustics and that sort of thing. Do you think this helps you when it comes to... Uh, working on something like a mix, having spent a lot of time in those environments and hearing how sound will throw in, an, in a nicely treated acoustic environment? Or do you bring that into your productions, that sort of live feeling with things? Oh, good question. Um, if anything, I, I'd rather try to stay away from stuff like, um, you know, the subwoofer and stuff like that. I'm very careful with my mixes actually, what I deliver to the dub stage because they are gonna do the actual movie mix. And I really want them to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. I do love being at the dub stage and giving input. And, yeah. um, you know, I mean, not too much. You don't wanna be bothered, but <laughs> um, <laughs> or they will not invite you back. No. <laughs> um, but I like to go and kind of, you know, if I notice something, you know, could get pushed or something could get put into the subs or, mm -hmm. you know, I, I love giving input on that, but that's kind of not something that I plan into my music by default. Understood. For the music, I'm really just planning um, on delivering really good stereo files that work with everything. Mm -hmm. And then we do the live recordings, we do the surround mix, deliver it, and then they can work their magic. And if I can give some input on that, I mean, that's great, but that's not always the case. Cool. Okay. No problem at all. Um, and uh, I guess you mentioned before that you used to go obviously to the theater on a weekly basis, subscription style. What have you been doing during these times uh, to keep uh, keep things fresh so you can keep working because things get quite monotonous stuck in the same space, I guess? Uh, yeah, they do. I mean, I live close to the beach, so I just uh, hop on my bike and just bike at the beach. Okay. Um, but wait, someone's knocking on the door. Yeah, Can you go for it. That's totally fine. Yeah, no, problem. <laughs> One second. no worries, no worries. All right, here I am again. Oh, they're doing maintenance this week. That's a lot of... Uh, is it noisy? A, of, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, it's frustrating. It has to be done. Anyway, so... Um, uh, yeah, I try to get uh, out of the house quite a bit. Um, I don't manage it as often as I would like, but thankfully the weather is always good and, you know, there is the ocean, we have mountains, so there are ways to get away. Um, 
but yeah, I actually, I am an indoors person. Mm. So for me, it's also just a lot of Netflix, <laughs> Amazon, yeah. uh, you know, YouTube, just all right. What's, I mean, finding something good to watch at the moment is, is getting scarce because p- people have had a lot of viewing time. So do you have any left of center hot tips for the Netflix or the uh, Amazon? Not really. I no. think we're all watching the same <laughs> thing. I, I even saved some things. Like I, I saved the Mandalorian for mm. a little bit, but then I caved and watched it. And I did the same with the Queen's Gambit. I watched uh, I watched that months after it came out. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to save some of the good things and not watch them instantly. Mm. But, it's difficult. Um, it's difficult. It's uh, difficult. It's difficult. <laughs> And uh, so we, while we're on this, what's your, of late, what have you been your favorite scores? Of late, I did love The Queen's Gambit. Mm-hmm. I thought that was brilliant. Um, I did like the Wonder Woman 1984 soundtrack a lot. Ugh, I haven't watched it, actually. What's the, what's the music like? I'm assuming some synths in there. Um, it's strangely, it's more old school Zimmer. Oh, um, okay. It's a lot of uh, a choir and strings. There's like the super romantic theme going on, but also this uh, Olympics type piece. It's it's quite nice, okay. actually. You're really um, big on the strings, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've obviously listened to some of your work and it's very, very heavily featuring the strings. I've Honestly, I, I make the dance music and I haven't used a string for a while. And it, I used to play in orchestras and strings are beautiful. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, you can't really um, get away from it. I yeah. think if you're writing orchestral music. <laughs> yeah, I, I can understand that. It really does bring a certain feeling and emotion that is hard to sort of well, synthesize with anything else. Yeah, Absolutely. Definitely. Um, okay, so some tough questions now. What is your mental secret weapon? If you have, let's say, like a, a high pressure session that you have to complete and it's not a good day, but you have to complete the session, what, how, do you, how do you pull it off? How do you bec- remain the pro? As in life session or composing? Uh... What, whichever is most challenging for you. <laughs> uh, the composing is more challenging. Okay, yeah, let's say you have a deadline life, for that. With live sessions, you don't really have a choice, especially if I'm there conducting, you know, I have to be active the entire time. So you don't really have time to think about, oh, I'm tired or anything. Yeah. Um, you know, you're just there and people are looking at you. So yes. <laughs> kind of being in the spotlight, you don't really have a moment to freeze. Mm-hmm. Um, and also it's way too expensive to not be, <laughs> <laughs> to not be on your A game there. Yeah, fair. Um, yeah, composing can be a bit of a challenge. I mean, what helps me is routine, not falling out of routine. I just had that challenge cause, um, I had a lot going on literally until like December 20th, um, And then I just decided, you know what, nothing that I'm doing right now is due immediately. So I will actually take, you know, a good 10, 14 days off, just, you know, just not doing anything. Yeah. And all I did was, you know, edit some YouTube videos and stuff for fun, but I didn't really work on anything. Um, And I had such a hard time getting back into it after that. It's kind of like when you're in school and you take the six week summer vacation, getting back into school mode is so difficult. So I always try to actually not do that, to not fall out of my routine, Um, but to just reduce the amount of uh, hours that I work and the amount of music that I write. But to just, even when I'm taking a day off, to just sit down boot up my software and even just write eight bars nothing else just to stay in the mindset of i am writing something it doesn't have to be a finished piece or anything just just to not fall out of this because to me it's like working out you know if you skip a day all right you just skipped a day but if you skip Mm -hmm. two days it's gonna get more difficult on day three to do it 
then you skip a week and all of a sudden you haven't worked out in a month you know it's like this mm -hmm. and I feel like that same thing happens to me with composing I cannot have too many skip days <laughs> otherwise I'll fall out of that routine and then it becomes such a big mental thing for me you know to yeah. sit down and do stuff yeah um, okay because once I'm sitting down, it's fine. Once I'm sitting there and I'm writing, um, it's usually not a problem. I usually have ideas and I, I usually enjoy it. It's really more that tiny mental resistance before you sit down to go, ah, do I really want to do this right now? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So trying to take that out of the equation for me is the best trick, trying to make it such a routine like brushing your teeth or making your morning coffee that I don't even think about it. It's just something that I do that is non-negotiable. Okay, that's, that sounds like a very uh, apt answer. I, I, if my memory was better, I'd tell you who the quote was from, but it, it essentially was the same thing saying that it's not the writing that's difficult, it's the getting started. Yeah. They actually sit like making yourself sit down and do it. So I guess if you're in the habit of this, then it's never an issue because the getting started is easy. The writing we can do, but it's the thinking before beforehand that I, I think gets in the way, isn't it? Yeah, um, definitely. And yeah. I mean, it, which doesn't mean I don't have my weekdays, you know, of, I try to, um, I do that with my team now that on every project at the beginning, we pick two days per week that we take off. Um, cause I've noticed if we work seven days a week on a project, our productivity goes down because mm. our mental, um, resistance gets too strong after a couple of weeks. And we are just having such a hard time just getting started. Mm -hmm. So, um, I make it a point to tell everybody at the beginning of a project every week, we're going to take two days off. You guys can decide which days those are. Um, ideally nobody takes the same days off. Mm -hmm. But this way, our productivity stays much, much higher throughout a project, um, which seems counterintuitive that taking time off would make you more productive, but it actually works. So that's that's what we've been implementing now. There we go. There's a the million dollar tip. That's <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, though, really. Yeah, it's too hard. You can't do things 24 seven. We don't we don't work that way. Um, yeah. Kind so of a Hollywood disease. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, look, I think a lot of humans in industries everywhere have had this issue, mm. especially since we got technology. You, you, n nothing stops ever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you have to make yourself stop these days. Um, so yeah, routines obviously very important, um, and, and obviously this involves sitting down to write things. Outside of that, um, included in your routine, I guess, to keep you uh, inspired. And, and just feeling good overall. You've already said, obviously, that you're watching um, for enjoyment anyway. You're already consuming a lot of the media, which obviously you're hearing the scores behind the show or the movie as well, and uh, physical exercise. What else is involved in your sort of overall process to keep you inspired as an, as an artist and able to keep working you know, as a busy artist? Um, to me, listening to non-film music. I, I really enjoy listening to film music, but sometimes I get so stuck in the, you know, five soundtracks or something that I just like at the moment. Um, to really break out of that, ask my colleagues, what are you listening to? Um, or just really, you know, go on to platforms that suggest new artists to me. Um, you know, just kind of trying to listen to as much music as I can that isn't film music. And it doesn't even matter what genre it is or whether I like it or not, just to, you know, get that input and to, um, to broaden my horizon and to see what more is possible. Because I do have the habit sometimes to fall into certain patterns, listening patterns, but also composing patterns. And then I kind of get stuck in that but something I have noticed from doing a lot of studio pitches here is that it's such a wide variety of stuff that one needs to do and that hasn't necessarily been asked of me yet. But then I get a pitch and, you know, they want Caribbean influences all of a sudden or they want, um, you know, rock influences all of a sudden. You know, not every pitch that I do is orchestral. And so I figured 
uh, it's a really bad idea for me to just listen to orchestral music and not broaden my horizons. Right now I'm um, really into learning how to do more synth programming because uh, I always have the issue that when I get a project that requires a hybrid score with a lot of synthesizer stuff in it, I get such a you know mental block because I'm so nervous about it because it's not my field of expertise. Mm -hmm. And that's something, for example, that I'm working on right now um, just to watch as many tutorials and take private tutoring and to just take the mystery out of that so that I can imagine a synth sound and actually open up, you know, zebra and just go, all right, I'm going to make that sound now because mm. right now I'm not capable of doing that. I'm just capable of going through presets, finding the one that comes close and then modifying it a little bit. But that takes so many hours just going through thousands of presets. Yes, and it does. Finding the sounds and then modifying the sounds. And then I can't figure out how to make it do what I needed to do. So it's just such a huge um, 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 point of anxiety for me that, you know, this is something that I'm working on right now. And it's so inspiring to just learn how to actually use these tools and what they can do. So now it's like a whole new world for me outside of the orchestra and outside of presets uh, and to just go, oh my God, this, you can do anything all of a sudden. Yeah, you know? yeah so, they're very exciting devices, aren't they, a synthesizer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just learning new tools, trying out new tools, learning new skills. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, I never thought of this. And now I can do this. And now I could, you know, do this whole other thing. That's why I love doing these interviews. Such a good answer, <laughs> especially when we get down to the synth stuff. Obviously, as you said, you're quite specialized or comfortable uh, when it comes to doing string arrangements and when working with strings and that orchestral sorts of things. And then you've gone to push into obviously synthesizers, which was I'm assuming quite uncomfortable when you started, you're, you know, you're yeah. working with a tutor or something like this. Uh, obviously there's a bit of a, we spoke before, you know, it, the hard thing is getting started. Once you got started with synths, how long did it take you, I guess, to flip from it being very frustrating and feeling very like a, you know, a beginner, I guess, to being able to enjoy them in some way near to what's happening with your orchestral work? I'm definitely not there yet. I still feel like a beginner. <laughs> <laughs> but are you having fun now? That's the beginning so many... of you overcome that sort of like adversity towards it or is it still a bit like... Yes, I mean, there's no... Um, now I'm more in the it's fun to learn um, uh, mindset. You know, now it's not this fear of, oh my God, I have to open this up and now I have to figure this out and I know nothing about this. Hmm. Now it's more of a okay, I can tackle this and I can learn it. And it's, it's fun to explore. I still feel like a complete beginner. Yeah. Um, but now I have the confidence to know I can overcome this okay. with just enough practice and enough experimenting. I can, you know, get to a point where I'll feel comfortable with it. But I don't expect it to go quick because honestly, getting more comfortable in the orchestral world it took me probably 10 years, mm -hmm. a good 10 years of study mm -hmm. and practice. And not that I know everything about that, but you're right. I feel comfortable in that, uh, in that arena. Um, but yeah, that took probably just learning how to orchestrate properly, how to write proper counterpoint for orchestra and how to produce it, how to make proper mockups and mix orchestra and all this stuff. I'd say it took me a good 10 years to get there. So um, I wouldn't assume that it will take me any less to feel 100% comfortable with synthesizers. It's going to take probably several years to get to the point where I feel like now I'm a synth wizard and I can do anything. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I think I, what I was trying to get in, uh, drill down into there a little bit more is the fact, because this is something that I experienced when I came to Germany, is with being generally quite comfortable with everything I was doing. And if anything, sort of more towards a higher level, then I came here and I started to try to speak German, which was completely foreign to me, which as 
as with synthesizers too, I, I, I feel like it's such a weird feeling and it's very intimidating to actually go and tackle something as a complete beginner after you've taken under your wing a whole bunch of other things over many years um, and become very confident with them. It's really hard to start yeah. from the beginning again, but it's nice, I guess, to hear that on the other side of that, that you're now finding inspiration in this, uh, what was once very common feeling of learning, but you know, when you get to this stage of being quite comfortable and focusing more so on business aspects and those sorts of things in an industry, being a novice at something is just not yeah. something that happens ever. It's so hard to go back to a place of complete learning, knowing it is. nothing. Because you're not used to being incompetent anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, it's kind of tough to deal with the fact that you know nothing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, especially exactly. as a director type person that wants to be in charge and saying how things run. Yeah. Exactly. Because we're so used to it as you know, children and teenagers, we're used to not knowing anything and learning. And then at some point you become a professional and you're kind of getting used to okay, I know this software and I know how this works and I know how that works and we have a workflow and we have this and that. Yeah. And then to go back and start something from scratch, it's so scary and it really takes a shift in your mindset to go, okay, I have to take my hat off. I'm not the boss right now. I'm not the teacher right now. I am the student right now and I have to learn this um, and then learn to enjoy it as well. So, um, yeah, it's, I think it's really important in any creative profession. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, but it's something that I think, I think it's dangerous if you don't sort of re-enter that environment, then yeah. you'll miss you like, uh, as you've uncovered it, it does unlock again, this totally different form of inspiration where you can have very yeah. new ideas, which I think more, maybe they're not new for someone else, but I guess as an artist, they're new, they're very exciting because it's this whole other world that you're able to unlock creativity within. Um, yeah, and I think everybody everybody will use it differently. I will not be using synthesizers exactly the same way as someone else does because I come from an orchestral background. So I'm pretty sure that will have a very strong influence on how I will weave synth sounds into the orchestra. So, of course. You know, 100%. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens when you become a synth master as well then. Um, Just give me another decade. Yeah, another 10 years. Yeah, I think there's a, a book called Mastery. They talk about, they did a big study on how long it takes to master something. And um, it was about 10,000 hours, which people generally are taking about five, 10 years, depending on how much time. So I think you probably classify yourself as, as a mastered orchestra now. Uh, so it's on, on to synths. Um, yeah, the next <laughs> that's it i wanted to talk to you a little about and about um are you still on the board for alliance for women film composers yes i am okay cool because this is something that's been brought to my attention i spoke with a young female composer adele etheridge woodson i don't know if you know her mm -hmm. i've seen she's been yeah. featured in some press that you've done as well so um notice there but i asked her i guess about um you know, how she felt about being a woman in this industry in particular, because it is very heavily male biased. I saw something like 6% of the industry. 6% is... was our highest number. We're down now, I think, to 4 or 5%. Okay. Yeah, our right. numbers have decreased. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Yeah. So um, it's been, I think, what, two or maybe three years now since you've been involved with that alliance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you do? Um, why did you get involved with the board? And um, what do you hope, I guess, to see in the next, let's say, five years in terms of an increase in the amount of female uh, film composers? I think we currently have a lot of female film composers that are my age that are, you know, millennials. Mm -hmm. um, so you will have a hard time seeing a lot of women at the highest end productions because, you know, those go to, you know, mostly older, more experienced people. But I do think within the next five years, you're going to see at least, I think, looking at my peers here in Los Angeles, there are I would say between five and 10 uh, female composers that are 
currently coming up here doing productions that are getting a bit of attention or that are coming up under bigger composers and those composers are helping them. Mm -hmm. So I think there will be a shift. We are creating more awareness and visibility for ourselves yeah. um, and kind of uh, getting agents more onto our side to see that you know they add us to their rosters because if agents do not represent female composers, then the studios have this impression that for yeah, every yeah. pitch that they send out to the agencies, they're only getting male applicants, of course, yeah. mm -hmm. and usually also just white applicants. Um, but that's because agencies have historically only put these guys under their rosters. Right. Um, and yeah, that's kind of uh, one of the issues because you can't apply for an opportunity that you don't hear of, of course. Of course. Okay. So, so it sounds like potentially this whole thing is not so much a top down thing. It's more so in the middle where the representation is for composers that there's a bit of a, in, a problem. In a way. I mean, there are different gatekeepers at different of, levels. Of course. Agencies are definitely gatekeepers mm -hmm. um, and they need to make an effort. Yes. And they, they are maybe not as much as they could, but they are making an effort to um, sign more diverse talent right now. Cool. Not just women, but also, you know, just people of color as well. Um, but also studio executives need to pay more attention. I think Netflix is currently doing a fantastic job. That is good to I mean, their executive pool is completely diverse. Everyone there, every gender, every color, but also behind the camera, in front of the camera. I mean, they're making such an effort. I would agree. To give um, opportunities to new talent, younger talent. And I've talked to them about this and they said, yeah, we have the advantage of being a young company. So we don't have, you know, our go-to sure. clients. We don't have our go-to, um, you know, agents. We don't, we don't have old systems in place. We can just build everything from the ground up. Amazing. and just make up our own rules. Whereas if you look at older studios that have been around for a hundred years, there are still a lot of people in charge right now, you know, from different times that may have different preconceptions about, you know, who they want to work with, who is capable of what. So, you know, there has to be a slow changing of the guard, but with those giant corporations that are so old, you just have these systems in place that have been in place for a hundred years. And mm -hmm. it's, it's just very slow to change, which doesn't mean they're not trying, they are. There's an active effort being made. Okay. But uh, it, it takes a moment for them to do that. Of but course. with the Alliance, um, yeah, we are partially making sure that we create resources for our members. That's really why I joined. I'm currently giving uh, monthly tech sessions for our members, for example, and I'm managing a composer assistant list that um, they can join that we use to recommend people. Um, so uh, we're, we're currently doing member interviews, spotlights to put on the website. I'm part of that. Um, two friends of mine have developed a mentorship program. So every year, or every two years we get some high profile composers and this year we have, I think um, John Powell is a mentor and um, Michael Dana and I think Chris Leonard's was one at some point. Um, I don't remember uh, everybody, but you know, we're getting okay. some high level people in to mentor young female composers. They can intern with them and, you know, kind of shadow the composers and learn. So we're trying to create a lot of resources and access to our members. And at the same time, I also know other board members are very busy um, with the executives, talking to studio executives, producers, talking to filmmakers about this, going onto panels, um, making, uh, you know, giving press interviews and just kind of being out there talking about the issue and kind of putting this into hiring entities' minds that, hey, we exist to mm. um, make an effort, please. You know, there's also a whole push for um, award recognition because very often the press and also awards overlook female composers, especially if it's indie productions. 
So there's a bigger push for that as well to get recognized more and to at least get onto those short lists and that people can vote on, you know, just all kinds of stuff where traditionally we've been overlooked and they're trying to undo that. Okay, cool. So it, it does sound like despite it being a huge disparity, there is actually a lot of uh, movement with this issue and things are working to change, but due to a lot of, I guess, well, the production companies at the end of the day being super old, there's a lot of red tape that we have to cut through to really see that in the big organizations outside of, of course, something like Netflix, which as you mentioned is super young, moving fast, not interested in what used to happen, <laughs> interested yeah. in moving forward and it's a global business. So being exclusive is, is gonna hurt you in some markets. So there's no point doing that. That's, that's really actually nice to hear from you that, uh, well, as we said before, I'm pretty sure Netflix is you know, one of the biggest things there is that at least with that huge influence in this um, industry, that there is a forward thinking approach to this issue, which is quite a big one at present. That's, that's yeah. really cool. It's very nice to hear. Um, well, yeah, I think we got a lot of great stuff there. Do you have anything else you want to promo or anything you want to talk about? <laughs> um, oh, good question. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Really. Well, I'm going to, I just came across, uh, you said it doesn't matter what sort of music. So I randomly came across this piece of uh, this album today. It's by Red, Red Snapper. Have you heard of them? I don't think so. Nor had, nor had I. It's from 2000. Um, the album is called Our Aim is to Satisfy. It's, it's weird. It sounds like it's a band, but it's kind of recorded like breaks. It's just 2000. So I think breaks were quite popular then, but it's, it's interesting. There's some, a lot of textures and a couple of the guys, I had a bit of a quick, a quick dig on Discogs. Um, a couple of the guys have done some work in film composition as well. So maybe that's something that can uh, give you some inspiration for the work. Yeah, I'll, I'll check it out. Red Snapper. Yeah, Red Snapper. Red Snapper. I don't know. I think it's I think it's interesting. It's it's different. I it's there's so much music coming out. So much of it is the same. It's very rare that I'll listen to a piece of music and be like, wow, this is actually some individual like I concept. It's 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 see what you think. <laughs> um, yeah. But. Uh, obviously you're working with orchestral stuff and you just started playing with synths. I would love to send you over a copy of what do we have uh, strings boutique, which we just put out, which is basically just hybrid strings and synths in contact nice. wrapper. Um, and we also just put out brass boutique, which is the same. This boutique series is basically all going to be hybrid stuff. I guess it's kind of Zimmer inspired, but um, with our own little twist on it. Is there anything else that you've got holes in your library that you wouldn't mind a little bit more of like content wise? Uh, Cause we focus on, I guess, weld stuff. So if there's a particular region or something you're digging into, maybe there's something we can shoot you from somewhere around the globe. World stuff. Yeah. Oh, that's... A lot of Asian stuff, um, mm. but it, smaller sort of regions. I mean, how about this? Um, since I have a YouTube channel, mm. I can just uh, also do reviews of the stuff and yeah. check it out and just, um, you know, make actual review videos of it. Yeah, I'd we would, to, we, I'd love we to would... check it out and just just see. Um, I, I just got sent a library to make a YouTube video, um, which is also world music. And funny enough, the one before that, I also got uh, the world sweep from UVI. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> Apparently world music is something <laughs> that people keep sending me. And it's very funny because I actually have an, a project coming up where I will need all of that. So cool. Well, um, we'd, we'd yeah. love to, yeah, we'd love to get some across. Definitely keen to ca collaborate with you on some content. As I said, like in our first message, I think this is one of the things that also uh, caught my attention. Um, just completely lost what I was going to say. Um, the stuff if you no it's gone <laughs> <laughs> oh the, yeah of course sorry no it's it's back with me now so um i don't know if i mentioned at the time but we have we are running alongside rast sounds we've also started rast academy recently which focuses on education 
Um, mm -hmm. And this, we're just getting started with it. So it's not like something that would happen immediately, but certainly with what we've seen already from what you've done, you've definitely, you've got the experience and you know how to make nice looking content. Um, so if there's anything that you've been, I guess, um, even if it's a small kind of weird niche thing, I'll send you over something from there so you can see kind of what is there. But mm -hmm. if there's something that a course or something that you've been thinking of doing outside of what you're normally doing, which maybe caters to a different niche or something like that, then there's definitely an opportunity to work together, creating some content of an educational style as well outside of that Nice. at any yeah. time. Um, yeah, I'd love that. Yeah. So yeah, we're definitely looking for people to work with this year and, um, We'd, we'd love to keep sort of in touch with you and have you be a part of that community. We're also going to be donating to the Alliance for Women Film Composers as well. Um, obviously, we work Wonderful. with, yeah, we work with people from all over the world. Um, so we're very much, I guess, about equality, be it of gender or race or whatever. Um, yeah, so we're happy, very happy to support that, that cause as well. But, um, yeah, it's really been a pleasure speaking with you. I was pretty excited about this. For me, this was a... This was a higher profile person that I get to talk to. So. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, no, it was. It was good. It was good to get some insights from you. There's some really, really nice answers we got from you there, which I think will help other creators out there get through their creating time. I, I hope so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>